So in this lesson we're going to be talking about sculpture. Unlike painting, which can be viewed all at once, sculpture asks us to walk around, to consider it from a tactile sense, and to also notice how the object sculpts the space in what we call negative space. This image is from the first page in this chapter, and it's by Alawe of Ise, a very famous African sculptor who worked in wood. What I want you to notice here is a trick that is a hallmark of his sculpture style and right here head that's actually free moving. It's inside of this uh, kind of a this fence you could say of people. This figure right here could rattle around and roll around in there. Now consider sculpting that with primitive tools by hand. He was truly a master. So this is one example of the multifaceted, multi-sensory nature of sculpture. And we'll be looking at that from a variety of different angles with this chapter. This material is intended as a supplement to this week's chapter. So speaking of tactile, check out this one. Here's an example of the extreme sensory nature of sculpture. So we look at this and it feels prickly. Can you imagine walking through this tunnel? What would it smell like? What would it feel like? It would really surround you with the art, which is quite different than what we see when we are looking at a, a low relief or a two-dimensional flat work of art. Now let's look at a couple of different ways that sculpture can be created. Speaking of low relief, that's what we have first. This was typically used in uh, Egyptian sculpture. Actually, this is what we call sunken relief sculpture. So there's a flat surface, and the artist removes the material in order to reveal the sculpture. This particular work is very interesting because in Egyptian art, it marks a departure from the very strict conventions that artists had really followed for thousands of years. This pictures the ruler Akhenaten and his wife and their children. And even though they look a little silly to us now, maybe that baby is like a teeny, tiny, oddly shaped figure, for its time it was revolutionary because they look a lot more naturalistic and human than the sculptures that had come before in Egypt. And again, at the time, this really was radical and it basically upset the stability of society. So this would be an example of what we call a sunken relief sculpture. Now let's look at a low relief sculpture where substance is taken away, but we still pretty much need to view it from the front. This is often used in architecture. For example, in the friezes of the Parthenon, this is what was used. And now let's look at high relief sculpture. Oh, one more example of a low relief sculpture that makes it easy to remember would be a penny or a quarter. A coin is, is relief, is a low relief sculpture. Let's look at high relief sculpture. Here, there's a lot more dimensionality to it, but yet it's also part of a flat surface. It's coming out from a flat surface. So in this case, we might want to see the sculpture from the side, or we might want to touch it in some cases, but it wouldn't be something that would be possible to walk all the way around and still experience. That would be called sculpture in the round, or fully three-dimensional sculpture. One thing to consider when looking at sculpture is that often the artist is going to think about where the person is looking from. For example, a sculpture such as a gargoyle or many of Michelangelo's sculptures that were designed to be put up on high above the viewer, they'll have that orientation in mind so that when you look up at them, they're actually meant to be seen from that vantage point. Oh, speaking of Michelangelo, in the textbook they talk about one of his sculptures that's called the Pietà, and it's an example of sculpture in the round. Now, 
for the Pieta that's featured in the textbook, that was done uh, very close to his death. It's actually the last sculpture that he did. And you can see where another artist has probably finished one of the figures. Well, I want to look more deeply at the idea of the Pieta by looking at another earlier, one of the first sculptures of Michelangelo. And this is one of the truly great masterpieces of Western art. This sculpture was done when he was about 28 years old. And let's stop for a minute and imagine that this is marble. I think it's about six feet tall, but look closely here. Look at how the hands of Mary, oh, let's define first. What do I mean when I say Pieta? Well, that means Mary holding the dead Christ. Okay, so there's Gothic Pieta, there, there would be uh, the one that we saw that Michelangelo did later where he put himself, a portrait of himself, into the rendering of Mary holding the dead Christ. But this particular one, let's go back here. Now look, notice how Mary's hands are imprinting the flesh in such a way that the figure that she's holding doesn't quite look alive. Now I also want you to notice the fabric. Okay, let's remember, what is this? This is marble. This is marble that he sculpted in about 1450, okay? So using rather primitive chisels and uh, sand and polishing it, this is such a masterpiece. Now there's a few criticisms that people made at the time that it was completed. One of them is notice the relative size. See now, if Mary stood up, and she stood next to, we'll imagine that this deceased Christ can also stand up, he would come up to like her shoulder. She would be a lot bigger than him. But when you look at it from the idea of a composition, that's just right. One of the things that so strikes me about this work that makes it a masterpiece is we have two emotions. We have the Christ figure as um, viewed and revered in Christianity who is dead in the Mary the saint. But we also have a mother who has just lost her child. Now, another of the criticisms was that they made Mary look so young. And once a Catholic priest told me that the joke or what they say about that is that because she lived such a pure life that she was so virginal that she did not ever age. But all that to say, let's come back to this as a masterpiece. It is truly a masterpiece of art. Now one more story that's kind of interesting is that he finished this masterpiece when he was 28 years old. Michelangelo was known for being a fiery figure, quite a temper actually. So after he finished it, people said, oh, that young man could never have done this. He did not do it. So he sneaked into where it was in the night and here on the sash, he put his name, Michelangelo Bonarotti, and it's there to this day. Now, afterwards, the, say, the, the word is he was very ashamed of that. He was embarrassed by his um, act of temper, and he never did anything like that again. But he signed it right across the chest of Mary. And yes, Michelangelo, the great master, created this work. So if you want to remember one piece of art, just for your life and to sound intelligent, Michelangelo's earlier Pieta is one that is quite famous and is truly a masterpiece. Now, as I mentioned, this recording is meant as a supplement to the text, so I'll ask that you do read chapter 5. Speaking of, we were just talking about how an art can be uh, kind of revolutionized, revolutionary for its time. For example, Michelangelo didn't have the proportions correct in his Pieta. Well, here's another one. This piece is by the great sculpture Rodin, and it, it for its time, it was considered to be quite revolutionary and controversial. It took 10 years for him to complete this sculpture. But here's the story. It's called The Burgers of Calais. So it's basically the, the town council of the town of Calais. So they were faced with a choice that they could surrender their lives and their town would be spared from an invading army. So these are the men who have made this choice to surrender their lives 
in order to save the people of their town and they're going to their death. So at the time the town was probably looking for a more noble representation but what Rodin chose to do is he showed the very real turmoil that anyone would face at their moment of death as they went to their own execution. Another thing that was very radical was the accessibility of this sculpture. I've seen copies of it and it's really not very far off the ground at all. That's maybe 8 to 12 inches, this uh, stand that it's on. So you can walk right up to it. Again, the convention of the time was to have them elevated and idealized, and he did not do that. But having broken with convention, he's created truly a masterpiece that brings us to the emotion of someone who has chosen to sacrifice their own life so that the people of their town can be spared. Now, let's move on and look at another great master, who's, that would be Henry Moore. I want to present this one because, again, we can go way back to the beginning when we ask the question, uh, does it have to look, quote, real to be strong art? And Henry Moore is a great master. If you're ever at the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City, they have a lot of his small studies that he used for these great sculptures, so you can really see his process. I recommend that. It's a wonderful museum and uh, free, so you can go and and see how uh, Henry Moore created his work. And also, if you're at this Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City, you'll probably see this, which is the giant shuttlecock. And it's giant. Um, let's see, if I walked up to it, I'd be about right there at the top of my head. And it sits on the lawn, just as if some giants were playing croquet and they dropped the birdie. But really, um, it's what we call pop art sculpture by a man named Klaus Oldenburg. And I'm bringing this in because Jeff Koons is in the, the chapter this week. And he's someone who took this idea kind of to an extreme of taking everyday objects and calling them art. Now what Klaus Oldenburg has done is he's taken everyday objects and he's put them way out of scale. And that's his way of creating art. When this was first put on the grounds of this rather conservative at the time museum, uh, it was so controversial. Many people hated it. It was in the 1980s, but now it's become a much beloved part of the museum. So let's look at one more of Klaus Oldenburg. So the idea of this art is to really just make you smile, you know, make you consider how you look at things every day and how you might actually look at them differently. So, in our text, we also, they bring forth the modernist sculpture of Ernest Trova. So, when we look at this sculpture uh, of the early 20th century, it's important to consider what was going on at the time. So, within maybe 20 or 30 years, we have the automobile, electricity, uh, the phonograph, movies, the revolution of the camera and film, and on and on and on. Airplanes, you know, all these things were happening in society, and it caused a sort of a cultural upheaval. Some people thought we were moving way too fast, and other people sought to embrace it. And artists expressed this conflict with a variety of works. And here's one example. There's a, there was a group called the Futurists in Italy, and uh, they had kind of controversial physic, um, governmental. They had kind of controversial beliefs about how government should be structured. They actually followed fascism, but they also were aligned with this kind of work because they believed that all answers were in the future. Uh, it's like leave all tradition behind and just do something totally new. And as we might have seen, some traditions in society can be quite useful, even as we move on and create new, uh, we modernize. And you know, some of this we can look at today as uh, our society moves forward with such leaps and bounds as technology grows uh, at such a pace. And one might occasionally stop and wonder if all advancement is useful and even as we continue to advance, as just asking these questions, 
can be quite useful. Now let's look at another rendering of humans from the same time, Schiacometti. So he's in the textbook also, and this is pretty much what he did. He made these tall, skinny figures and became quite famous for it. Now again, does it have to look real to be strong art? One of the things that he kind of has is um, they all look sort of isolated. Like his figures, they don't really look warm and fuzzy and happy, do they? Well, lastly, I'd like to take a look at a couple of examples of earth art. There's the spiral jetty in your book, and I was able to see that in person before it sank under the Great Salt Lake. It's a... Um, it was just a mound of earth and rocks with a road on top of it that spiraled out into the lake. And it was quite moving when it was visible. Now it has sunk under the water and just appears faintly on occasion. But when I saw it originally, what was so striking was that it was incongruous, like it didn't really belong there. It was just this spiral going out into the water in an otherwise very natural landscape. So that made it quite powerful. Here's a work by the artist Maya Lin, who did the Vietnam War Memorial and the Civil Rights Memorial that we see in the movies this week. She's done all sorts of earthworks and uh, large-scale sculptures. And here's one where water is the medium. So staying with water as the medium, let's look at the work of Andy Goldsworthy. Now he's a Scottish artist, and if you've not looked at his work, I strongly encourage you to seek out his videos or just to look him up online. I think I'll post one of his videos in a future module because he's so interesting. So there's several things that work here. First I'd like to say that this kind of a round arch is how he first became known. Goldsworthy made these when he was still in his 20s. He made these beautiful stone circles uh, on the fields in Scotland which is his home. But now he makes art works like this all over the world. And I'll state the obvious, this is going to melt. It will. So one of his points with his art, it goes from being uh, very, very transitory. He'll make art with leaves that are going to blow away. He'll make art that'll last just a minute or an hour. And then he'll make art that will last for centuries. Which leads to the question, if it's going to blow away in just a moment, is it still valuable art? Ah, that's a good question. And I think we've talked about that in class and we'll continue to reflect upon that. So this concludes the audio lecture on sculpture. Thanks for listening.